My name is Tobias Kurt. Um, on behalf of the uh, BEMC team, you see here with me in the panel Teubo Glatz, Jess Roman, Chisato Ito, and Megan Forrest. Um, we welcome you to this month's BEM talk. We provide uh, a talk and invite speakers every first Wednesday of the month. And um, hopefully you have been already listening to us. If not, welcome for the first time. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this event. Before I introduce today's uh, speaker, I would like to already announce uh, the next month's BEM talk by Annika Hoyer, which will be on December 7th. It will be an in-person event followed by a little get together. So if you are in Berlin and if you are around, please feel free to join us for the next in-person BEM, the last one of this year. Now today, um, we are very, very pleased to have Dave Rich uh, with us. Dave uh, is a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences. He's also a professor in the Department of Medicine and a professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine at Rochester University. He is the director of the Epidemiology Research and the director of the, MPH, of the PhD and MS program in Epidemiology in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Rochester. His primary research interests are in reproductive and cardiorespiratory health with specific um, aspect of ambient air pollution. He's involved in studies in the US. He also has conducted studies in China and he will today uh, talk about the use of case crossover design in air pollution accountability studies. Dave is also a good friend uh, of mine. He did the training with me at Harvard. So it's very good to see you, Dave, and uh, welcome to the BEM talk. Thanks, uh, Tobias. And again, it's uh, always a pleasure to see you and uh, see see the, see your team. Um, but uh, I, I appreciate the invitation to, to come and speak. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that uh, we do here uh, at the University of Rochester um, in New York, um, but specifically try to, to tie in some things with specifically with the use of the case crossover design in those. And we'll talk about some of the set of studies that we do, we call air pollution accountability studies. Right? And so I'll, I'll do a little background before I dive into um, some of the work um, uh, that we've done and, and what we're doing now. Right? And so um, whenever I give a lecture on air pollution, uh, you know, always have to start with that classic, what the heck is air pollution and when are you exposed to it? Um, you know, the, the, the big, huge classic episodes that people have heard of, um, you know, there's several around the world, but one that, um, you know, now is almost 70 years old is the London fog. These are pictures during the daytime. Um, but yet it looks like it's in the middle of the night. And there are these types of air pollution episodes that still do occur, these big, huge episodes. But these were some of the first that got people starting to think a little bit uh, about air pollution and could it have a, 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 a health effect, right? And some of the, the ways that people started to look at that to examine, are there actually effects of health? It's rather simple, but I wanna lay it out like this because some of the, the analytic methods that are used to study it are, are kind of based on this kind of approach. All right. And so in what we had happening in London is there was normally uh, pretty high levels of pollution being polluted. But normally what happens is there's polar air aloft above London. So the pollution that's generated um, rises up and then is blown away by the winds. But what can happen in lots of places around the world, and London is susceptible to this, um, is these temperature inversions happen. Um, and some big warm layer of air comes and sits on top of the city. So all that pollution that would normally leave is trapped there. And you get these big, huge air pollution episodes like this. So the London fog is exactly an inversion event. So the, what you're seeing here is um, look in purple um, is a measure of air pollution. It's particles. Uh, smoke particles uh, measured in milligrams per cubic meter of air. And what we see is kind of the background levels at the time there in London up until December 4th. Right? And then that temperature inversion comes and sits over top of London, trapping all the pollution there. And you see the pollution levels rise pretty dramatically over the next few days, both the particles and the sulfur dioxide levels. Right? But what people started to see as well is if we look, well, what are all the deaths or the counts of deaths at London hospitals occurring during that time? And what you see is that on December 5th, you start to see the increase in the deaths um, per day. And you see that follow the same pattern um, until the, when the, the inversion clears on December 8th, the air pollution levels drop, uh, the air pollution levels drop immediately and the deaths per day, the health events start coming down uh, as well. All right. And 
essentially what this is telling us is that, look, there's this air pollution episode, but we can look and study it by looking and tracking um, the health event in a community, the count of health events in a community, and the measure of pollution in the community. Right. And so there are lots of air pollution episodes around the world still today. This is some of our work. Um, well, we weren't doing this picture here, but we've done a lot of work in Beijing uh, during the time. And, you know, you'd see these masks at the time before we hit COVID. You know, people didn't wear masks um, too much, but it was fairly common then in, in China just to avoid the air pollution. Right. And this is, um, this is not fog that you're seeing. This is very heavy levels of particles and different gases um, that people are breathing in on a regular basis. Right. And we see um, other shots in Beijing from Tiananmen Square looking out to the Forbidden City. Um, not, uh, not very good visibility at all. Um, and it's kind of the same idea um, is that industrial, industrial development results in, um, results in air pollution that may have uh, health impacts. And we've seen this same pattern all around the world in Europe and the US. Um, you know, it just happens to be occurring uh, more so right now um, in, in China. Right. But we, I always give this talk that we, we see levels of air pollution at, at lower levels, but we do see them um, around the world here in the United States. Um, and the way that I always show it is, is looking at pictures with visibility issues. So this is from, uh, I'm from New Jersey originally, so I always like to show the New Jersey photos, but this is from Northern New Jersey, looking out directly at New York City. Right? And what you'll see on the top is a very nice well, and uh, it's nice, but it's a nice, clear, clean picture. The, the air quality is quite good and you can see individual buildings. So the pollution levels are really quite low. Uh, but then when you look down at Newark, um, the one at the bottom, um, that you can clearly, clearly see that brown haze that's occurring. And that's people, motor vehicles, uh, industry, pollution. There's lots of people there. So there's going to be pollution generated, right? People are exposed to that. People are breathing that in, right? And so we can do the same thing. I would feel like for Tobias, I have to put something in about Boston. Okay. This is from the North Shore of Boston, looking down, um, and you can see Boston in the distance. Um, and then in the bottom, you see a, a typical summer episode of air pollution. Lots of what we call a hot and hazy, humid day. Um, lots of ozone, lots of particles in the air, um, some really nasty stuff. Plus, it's about, uh, um, uh, you know, probably in the upper 30s Celsius, not real comfortable temperatures here. Right? But all of these air pollution episodes around the world, you're all being exposed to it. Um, and it's, it's um, uh, certainly something that we, we do need to, to keep thinking a bit about. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about some of the work, and I wanted just to lay out these terms. You know, we in environmental epidemiology, everything's an acronym um, or an abbreviation or a chemical symbol. So I wanted just to lay out a few of the, the terms for you. Right. Um, there's lots of gaseous pollutants that you're being that you're breathing in that are emitted from various things, as I said, cars, power plants, all kinds of different activities. Right. But there's also different particles um, that are emitted as well. And for the particles, um, we don't classify them necessarily always by their chemical composition. We talk more about their size. Right? And this has to do, if you could think of your bronchial tree, if you have, you're inhaling certain size particles, how deep in your, your bronchial tree do they, do they go? Right? And so if you look at the picture on the bottom right, that is a human hair. Um, in blue is a particle we call a PM10 particle, and that's particulate matter. And it's, less, it's 10 microns uh, in diameter or less. Right? And these are, uh, for what we talk about, fairly big particles. These can get down into your upper bronchi, but don't penetrate much beyond that. Right? Um, you can see on the top, uh, the next particle is what we call a, a PM2.5. This is one of the most heavily regulated pollutants around the world uh, and measured pollutants around the world. And these are, again, particles that are less than two and a half mic microns in diameter. And they can get down, generally get down into your alveoli. So whatever chemical comp components that are attached to that carbon particle then can elicit some sort of response there um, or even um, be transferred into systemic circulation. Right? And you can see that, um, you know, you see the picture of SARS-CoV-2 um, just as a, uh, a relevant. Um, some of the particles I'm going to talk about that we've been studying here long before I arrived in Rochester, looking at what we call ultrafine particles. Um, they're not visible on the scale, any of the scales we're talking about here. These are generally less than 100 microns, um, and a lot of them much, much smaller than that. 
And these, you breathe them in, you're breathing them in probably even now, but you breathe them in and they can enter um, systemic circulation directly, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about how all these things um, uh, may impact health um, and how we can impact, how we can study different air quality policies that have been implemented to control them. Do we see beneficial health effects of them? So some, the way that so, a lot of the air pollution work really started to be done was more of kind of, you can think just basic epi classic cohort studies, right? And this is um, published in 1993. This is the, one of the, the landmark studies of air pollution it's called the Harvard Six City Study. And the idea they did here was they uh, enrolled people in each of six cities across the United States. Right? And these six cities um, were kind of selected based on what the, the levels of pollution were like in those cities, some with higher levels of pollution, some with moderate levels, some with lower levels. Right? And so there's lots of different effect estimates, but I, I always like this one um, just because it lays it out quite nicely. If you look, um, each of the, these are survival plots over time, and you the pollution levels are highest in the cities of Steubenville, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, Harriman, Tennessee, and are lowest in uh, Topeka, uh, and Portage, Wisconsin. And what you can see here is that for study subjects that lived in some of the dirtiest cities in say Steubenville, um, you had about a 78% probability of surviving 14 years, right? And then if you compare it to the clean air pollution cities in those cities in Topeka and Portage, you had about an 88% probability of surviving 14 years. So the idea here is that the air pollution exposures uh, were associated with decreased mortality um, just by living in what city you lived in. And there's extensive um, review of these by um, reanalyses of them. Uh, probably tens of millions in, of dollars have been sent just in reanalyses of these data. So these are fairly robust to the statistical approaches um, uh, used. All right? But there's a lot of that classic cohort study approach. All right? But a lot of the work that, that we do, um, we've been starting to do, um, is really being looking more at the, what we call these acute effects, right? So we could think of air pollution, you breathe in air pollution repeatedly over days, over weeks, over months, over years, and you could um, have some sort of a, a effect on cardiovascular disease. Um, there's a few cohort studies now that have demonstrated that um, prolonged air pollution exposure, say at your residence or your house, has been associated with increased atherosclerosis. Right? So you increased cardiovascular disease, underlying disease. Right? And what we've been studying and some of the analytic methods we've been using is more now trying to talk about the very acute effects. Right? So I'm, I'm asking the question, if you breathe in air pollution, um, do you have some sort of acute health response over the next few hours or the next few days? Right? And we can use that time, that, excuse me, that um, study, this study uh, framework uh, really to be using um, uh, some of the other work that we want to do. So the picture I'm showing you here is asking the question, is air pollution associated perhaps with that thrombus formation, um, that last step before the myocardial infarction occurs? Right? And so we'll talk a little more, uh, more about that. Right? So some of the classic designs, and I, I apologize to Tobias that I didn't put up a, a formula for all these different models. Um, so apologies to you all for it, but I thought it might be best just to kind of describe them in general terms. Right? But the idea that a lot of the air pollution, if you think back to that London example I gave you, um, these where we're looking at daily counts of health events and daily air pollution levels, we can really do, those are really what we call, we call them time series analyses. And there's all kinds of different analytic models that have been used. I mean, at the beginning, it was more Poisson regressions, very simple Poisson regressions, then a lot of generalized additive models have been used, and then now certainly some more um, uh, you know, some more uh, causal methods have been applied as well. Uh, but generally, the idea here is to try to, again, uh, regress the daily count of a health event in, in a community uh, versus the air pollution level in that city that day in that community, right? And the idea, again, I always, it's tough to do over Zoom, so, but if the air pollution levels go up, um, do the health events respond? And if one goes down, does the other go down? And that's the general idea, right? So you're making assessments of these associations really over time, right? We're looking at one community over time and making those comparisons. We're not necessarily comparing uh, one city to another uh, in that way, 
right? And what's nice about air pollution, um, I always make my my other epidemiologist friends uh, jealous. I'm like, I always have exposure data because the air pollution data is measured at, in cities all around the world. So that data is publicly available, right? And we do some more sophisticated analyses, spatial temporal models estimating pollution um, at someone's home and things like that. But for, for the work that we're doing on the policy side, you can just use the monitoring data, which is really quite, um, quite useful for it. Right? So the time series analyses, again, um, the, what I want to lay out for you here before I get into the case crossover is that these analyses, um, when we're thinking about our changes in, in air pollution over time associated with changes in a health outcome over time, we need to be thinking of confounding, not necessarily by a personal characteristic of someone, like are they a smoker, do they have a, a comorbidity or something, but instead we really need to be talking about different temporal patterns. Right? So you could think of acute cardiovascular events occurring more often uh, early in the morning, uh, occurring more on weekdays than weekends, um, occurring more in, in, this, in the, usually, well, at least here in Rochester, New York, in the wintertime. Right? So we always talk about there could be confounding by time factors um, in these analyses that we do need to control for. And just a, a, a brief example, um, this is some slides from some work done in Ireland. Um, looking in the, what you're seeing here is each circle that you see is the uh, cardiovascular mortality rate, the number of deaths per 1,000 person years across Ireland right, um, by year and season from 1981 to 2001. So each circle you see is a seasonal estimate. Right? And those black circles are the winter time. Right? So if you looked at this, you'd say, well, the black circle is always at the top. So you're clearly you're seeing a seasonal pattern in mortality. Right, that's normal. And then what you see, if you're looking at the, the, the time trend over, over the series, you see clearly a decreasing rate. Right? So there's a temporal pattern of a long-term time trend. There's a temporal pattern in your health outcome of season. Right? If you look at air pollution levels, this is again from, from Ireland as well. And these are now seasonal uh, averages of black smoke, which is a, again, a particles, the number of particles or micrograms of particles per cubic meter of air. Right? And you see the same basic relationships. You see a seasonal pattern. Again, those black circles are the winter time. Right? And then you see this long-term time trend. It's not quite as pretty as the, the previous one, but you are seeing a decrease over time in the rate, uh, excuse me, in these concentrations. So what I'm laying out is just a, a simple thing here, but it's that there's these temporal issues, temporal confounding that can occur. And I've laid out just season and long-term time trend, but we could do the same thing for weekday, we could look at circadian patterns within the day. Um, I'm very interested in looking at very acute responses, um, looking at effects within a few hours, right? And we still need, we need to control for these, these kind of issues uh, confounding by these factors, right? And so the case crossover design, and I'll come back to those issues I just talked about, but the case crossover design um, was really, you could think of this as kind of analogous to a matched case control study. And if we think, let's say we're trying to study the relationship between having an MI um, and uh, um, vis vigorous exertion, right? You could think really that you could do a matched case control study and you could, you could have cases of folks that had an MI and you could go find out, okay, what's your usual amount or were you having vigorous exertion in the, you know, in the week or the day of your, your MI, right? And you could compare them to someone who didn't have an MI, a control, and ask that same question. All right, but the work that was done, uh, Malcolm McClure and others in the, determinant, in the um, determinants of, of the MI onset study, was really that they were finding all kinds of possibilities for selection bias occurring here when you're comparing one person to another. Right? And their idea was, well, you are your, in, in fact, are your best control. If we're really interested in looking at this, this temporal response, this response to an exposure, whatever it might be that occurs over a day, uh, an hour, a couple of days, um, why don't we find a way to do a study where we're looking and using you as your own control, right? And so really what this study design does, and I'll give you a picture of how we use it, is it compares each patient's experience on their MI day with their experience one day or some other time period before that when they didn't have an MI, right? And what that provides again is a nearly perfect matching control for each patient. They're, they're essentially a, a perfect match for themselves. Right? And you could think of this kind of as a non-crossover. You could think of, think of that crossover trial, but it's kind of the, the observational version of that. 
right? And so over time, some people cross over from being exposed to unexposed, right? So putting this in a context of air pollution, you know, um, wherever you all are right now, I was going to say, I drove, I got up this morning, um, drove um, in my car where I was certainly breathing in much higher air pollution levels after leaving home because there's lots of cars and buses and things. Um, I get out of my car, I'm breathing all of that in, and then I come into my office um, and I have much lower uh, exposure to air pollution, um, you know, from the you know, nice air filtration systems we have here and hopefully you have in your place as well. But the idea is that your air pollution exposure that you all had today, you've had some periods of higher exposure, lower exposure, and you're going back and forth. So the idea of the case crossover design is really to use that kind of a framework um, to really what we study, what we call triggering, right? These are short-term health effects of a transient exposure. Right? And that's how we've, we've been applying these over many years here. Um, and, and lots of people around the world are using these designs for such things, right? But the, the unique thing about the case crossover, a lot of these controls for confounding um, are really all done by design, right? Again, remember you're controlling because you're your own control in the study, things that uh, don't vary over time, these time invariant confounders, long-term smoking history, genetic characteristics, your health history, comorbidities are all controlled for by design, right? And then what's really unique, well, not unique, but I guess what's really useful for the work um, is that it's really, these factors are controlled for design and any interaction between them, right? And I'll come back to this, that point specifically. And the idea here is this is achieved completely through the study design. Uh, again, because each person forms its own stratum in which the, uh, the potential confounders are identical, right? We have some what we call time varying confounders that I discussed, these temporal patterns, long-term time trends, season, all of that can be controlled by design. And I'll give you, you an example, um, you example here, right? So the idea behind the time stratified control selection, this is kind of the, the state of the art right now that, that everyone uses this referent control procedure. There was a lot of work developing all kinds of different approaches. And this is what has been settled now, probably good for, good for good um, 15 years or so, right? So if we, let's look at that, that green period there. So this is a calendar month of March. And let's say we had some sort of episode or event, let's say a, a myocardial infarction that occurred at 11.45 a.m. on Tuesday, March 24th. So what we would select is that period from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on March 24th, that's our case period. And we can look at the air pollution level, let's say, um, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. that's measured outside. What we'll do for this case is we'll then match it to all the other Tuesdays within the same month of March, within the same year, right? And these will be my controls, right? And we can look and compare um, the air pollution levels during those red periods to those in the green, right? And if average across all my match sets, the air pollution levels in that green period are higher than those in the reds, um, then that's gonna suggest that air pollution is a contributing cause of that myocardial infarction event, right? And I, I, you always have to say, you know, I, yes, there are post-event controls here. That's usually not something you wanna do, um, but it is defendable here because the air pollution levels measured outside are not impacted at all by whether or not you had an MI or not. So the idea here is the, um, these exposure, these time periods, this is the source population that gave rise to the cases. These are the distribution of air pollution exposures in the source population that gave rise to these cases of MI. So these are valid, uh, valid controls. This has been well validated, right? So that's the idea, that's the basic design. Okay. And we and others have used this um, again around the world. Um, this is some of the work we've, we've been working on here is looking at different types of myocardial infarction. Um, trying to think a little bit about mechan mechanism is really how we were thinking of this first, right? Um, so what we were comparing was looking at ST elevation MIs, uh, the MIs where you have a full arterial occlusion, the more severe MIs, and then comparing uh, their response to pollution, um, comparing that to the non-ST elevation MIs. Right? And what, what we found here in Rochester specifically, um, if you look at that, the black circles, um, these are... Um, odds ratios, this is the odds ratio that's looking at the, uh, when the air pollution levels go up outside, um, after about one hour, you have about a 19% increased 
I'll say rate, an increased rate of an MI uh, following that. All right, and you have these effects, a very rapid response to pollution. Um, and you see, as you look at longer and longer averaging times, how this comes back then to, to, a, to a null effect. Right? We see this effect with, with the ST elevation MIs, I'll call STEMI, but we don't see them with the non-ST elevations, the end STEMIs. Right? And it might have something, you know, that'd be a completely different talk, but that might have something to do, with, you know, looking and thinking about platelet activation, aggregation, different platelet phenotypes, I think, is, is where the, the work really is. But again, the idea is the case crossover design and this specific looking at STEMI responses to pollution over this time frame, we can use this uh, in some of our, uh, our policy assessment work that we do as well, right? And so what we do is um, we do also a series of, not just as I said, looking at you know, health effects studies and what are mechanisms by which an exposure may cause a disease. We also do a sets of studies looking to say, all right, there's lots of air quality actions and regulations that have been put in place in various places around the world. Right? Do they offer a health benefit? Right? And the types of these policy studies with air pollution are what we call accountability studies. Right? And I'll give you a little more explanation and folks have uh, spent a lot of time you know, um, describing the, this type of work. But the goal really of, of any air pollution regulations, whether it's you know, here in the US passed by the, uh, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, in Europe, certainly there's various different uh, agencies, but if it's you know, World Health Organization around the world, whatever it might be, right? The goal of those air quality regulations is really to protect public health, right? So it says to regulate, uh, excuse me, is to implement some regulatory actions um, or providing economic incentives that help reduce the public's exposure to air pollution. So in the US, it's, well, it's our Clean Air Act. Right? And these policies should have some sort of air pollution reduction and should have an indicator of public health should improve. All right? And so the reason that I have these pictures here on the left, this was my last trip to Beijing before, uh, before COVID. Um, and it was one of, I, you know, I've been there many times, but one of the, uh, the one of the picture on the left is from the Temple of Heaven. It is this beautiful blue sky day with one of the lowest pollution levels I've ever seen in Beijing. Um, Beijing, the pollution levels were about 20 micrograms per cubic meter, which for Beijing is very, is very low. Um, later in that week, this is a shot from my hotel room um, where pollution levels were much higher. That evening, pollution levels got up to about 500 micrograms per cubic meter, which was the highest I'd ever experienced. And it was really uncomfortable, right? And so you sometimes have these types of episodes there at the bottom, but really what these regulations are trying to do is to bring it up into these, what we see these blue sky days. Right? So this type of work really is this accountability research. Right? And numerous studies, again, as I've said, have really reported uh, morbidity and mortality associated with pollution around the world. Um, you know, not me with, you know, certainly not me, but, uh, and hopefully not after this talk, you all, but some folks don't think there's much, could, could be not much causal there. And there's obviously some doubt, right? And so what, what we see there is all the studies that have been done, again, looking at when you have an increase in pollution, do you have an increase in a health event? And what these studies, these accountability studies, which are quite nice do, it says, well, if air pollution levels go down, do we see a lowering of the health rate uh, and going in the opposite direction? So hopefully that idea um, would provide some more, hopefully convincing evidence that this, this is truly a causal association, right? So provides that kind of a, an assessment as well. So when we do the, 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 these accountability studies, this is um, um, developed by the Health Effects Institute, this chain of accountability framework. Right? And really, uh, I'm gonna talk just kind of more on the, the bottom end of this in our work that we do, um, but others around, um, you know, I have colleagues that work on the exposure side, the, the environmental uh, exposure science side. And so you may have some sort of regulatory action that occurs in a region or a country or a city. All right, and so hopefully what happens then is you have a, some impact on the emissions, all right? So pollution isn't admitted as high, there's lower levels. And then that should lead to an improvement in air quality and then a lowering of the exposure that people in the community have, a lower doses of pollution and improved health responses, right? And so we, um, on the EPI side, we deal primarily with this down at the bottom um, and looking at changes in ambient air quality in a community does it have a beneficial health response, right? But folks, um, again, as you can imagine, 
Um, there's along all of these steps, there's lots of uncertainty uh, going on. There's lots of measurement error in all aspects, both on the exposure and the health outcome side, and then certainly bias and confounding as well. Right. So the, a lot of those types of issues that we need to be thinking about. So I'm going to talk, give you a real quick review, a, 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 a real quick summary of one, one of these um, accountability studies, just to give you an idea of the framework on what's done. But they've been done all around the world. Um, after I put this together, I felt bad. I felt I should have really done that German reunification uh, one a little more uh, locally relevant. So my apologies for not doing that. But um, there's been these kind of policy assessments um, that have been done all around the world. And I'm going to talk specifically about some of the work I got involved with in Ireland around a, a coal sale ban. Okay? But across all of these interventions, really they're asking a whole series of, of questions and some ask different ones. So for example, they're all asking certainly, well, what air pollution change occurred? Right? Was it that there was a decrease in just one pollutant or one source or were there lots of different things out there where all of the pollutants reduced? just the concentrations. And again, as you can imagine, you don't breathe in one pollutant at a time, you're breathing in a mixture. Right? And so what we're, we focus a lot here in Rochester on is not just the, the amount of pollution you're breathing in, but the kind of the, the, the chemical composition of the particles. We want to think about are, are some particles more toxic than others. Right? So I have that highlighted in yellow because we're going to focus on that in our work. Right? But we also want to assess was the, the change that occurred in the pollution based on the air quality action, was it permanent or was it only temporary, right? What I'm gonna to talk to you about in Ireland, there was a policy put in place. And so we say this is a, you know, a pre-post comparison, an AB comparison, it's permanent, right? What we did in studies we did in, in Beijing, I, I'm not gonna talk about for time purposes, but those are studies done around the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Right? And if you way back then remember that, what happened then in order for them to get the games is they had to promise to bring the pollution levels down during the games. So they put forth not only in Beijing, but all across the whole region of that country, they literally shut down all pollutants. You know, there was very little emissions going on at that time. Right? So during the games, there was about a 47 day window when pollution levels went down dramatically. And then after that, they went right back up. Right? So you had only a temporary change. Right? And so the other thing to think about with these accountability work is, is what kind of comparison is being made, right? Are we just comparing one population that has higher pollution levels to another population that has lower levels, a spatial comparison? Are we doing that kind of temporal response, a temporal comparison that I've been describing, you know, looking at that one population um, before and after a policy, before and after a change in uh, emissions, right? Or um, something certainly more complex um, we won't talk about here, but, you know, looking at, uh, you know, some of these economic uh, models where we look at a difference in difference models, these are uh, being used more and more for these types of uh, accountability studies. There's uh, colleagues I have uh, specifically working on some now, right? But the idea um, as an accountability study, this is one of the classic ones done in Ireland, all right? And the, there was an oil crisis in 1970s, and it obviously wasn't limited just to Ireland, all around the world. Um, the US, Europe, wherever else, um, that really led to use of solid fuels, primarily coal. Um, but in Ireland specifically, people were burning coal in their homes. You know, you buy a coal stove, use that to heat your home rather than a furnace that's burning oil or natural gas. Right? So you had a lot of that switch from oil to coal in the 1980s. So then what happened in Ireland and specifically in big cities like Dublin is you had the, the predominant source of pollution in the city was smoke from these residential to these residential uh, coal fires, right? And so you really had some very large episodes that were occurring. So in response to this, the government decided, well, let's do this in Dublin and let's, uh, they banned the marketing sale and distribution of coal. And this was kind of a cool way to do it. They didn't prohibit you from burning coal, but they made it damn hard for you to be able to buy any, right? And so they used this as kind of the incentive to make sure that people were not burning uh, coal anymore. And there was an immediate reduction. All right, so what you can see on the, on the left, this is very similar pictures um, to what I showed you. And it actually is the one of the pictures I showed you on the top, but it's looking at that black smoke uh, particle concentration, seasonal averages, right? And again, you see lots of variability and much higher levels on the left side of that graph before the smoking, excuse me, before the coal sale ban was put in place, right? And then you see about a 71% a decline overall in those concentrations after the coal sale ban. So you did see a dramatic decrease in, in the particulate pollution 
uh, levels in Dublin after the coal sale ban. Right? Um, now there was uh, extensive uh, health analyses done here. Um, and just for purposes of time, I can't go through those um, again. But what, what was done really um, highlighted in red here, and even try to draw your eyes down to the bottom, the bottom, uh, the respiratory mortality figure here, um, again, was looking to say was, well, was there a, a drop in respiratory mortality after the coal sale ban was put in place compared to before? Right. And so what you'll see here is this triangle down here says there was a 17% lower respiratory mortality among residents of Dublin um, after the coal sale ban was put in place compared to before. Right. And there's all kinds of different ways that they were controlling for background disease rates and things. Um, they do some of these comparisons. So this is um, uh, looking at that same time frame, the same analytic model but doing it in a, in a part of Ireland where the coal sale ban did not occur, right? And seeing, you know, you would not expect to see a change and there they didn't. So it was again, hopefully convincing evidence that this decline was, is, is uh, perhaps real, right? There's not as much uh, cardi as cardiovascular mortality effects or total mortality effects. And then there was other uh, coal sale bans occurring that were not uh, quite, they were in, in much smaller, I wouldn't even call them cities, I'd call them towns where they did not see any clear effect, right? But again, in Dublin, there was this, this rather large reduction in mortality. Right? So a lot of that, that precursor work to, to bring to you really to, to our work that we're doing here in, in, in New York State. Um, so just for, for um, everyone to know, this is obviously New York State. Down at the bottom there is New York City. Um, I'm up in that yellow uh, circle there. I, I'm, that's where I am right now. I'm in, in Rochester, New York. Um, not a city anywhere near the size, certainly of Berlin or New York City. Um, I always have to explain to people that I can drive from my house to my office in 10 minutes and I never hit any traffic. And my friends from New Jersey always laugh at me, like, how the hell do you not hit traffic? So it's, it's a, a city of about uh, 250 to 300,000 people um, spread out a bit. So it's, it's um, uh, uh, you know, that size. Um, we are the home of Kodak. Um, and Kodak is, was at the time this huge manufacturing uh, uh, um, site um, that really dominated the, the economy of the region as well as the, the environmental impact of the region. Um, that has since pretty much shut down. There's very little work there going on in terms of industrial manufacturing, very little going on there. So this is one of the, you know, Rochester is like a typical Northeastern United States city, heavy industry production manufacturing, that now um, over the past 20 or 25 years has really shifted its economy. And so you have a lot of this type of activity where you have lots of places with, that had reasonably high air pollution levels that are now starting to come down because of a lot of these air quality policies and, sh and um, shutdowns of different manufacturing sites like this. Right? So just in terms of air pollution levels, um, just to give the relevance, um, the Beijing stuff that I was talking about, you know, I told you about some really high levels that were occurring there. Uh, in Rochester, our average is about six or seven micrograms per cubic meter. We're really quite low. Um, I just looked up Berlin. Um, it says Berlin right now is about 19 or 20 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, which it says is moderate levels. All right, so certainly just a, a relevant scale. Um, the pollution levels here are quite, quite low compared. Right? But one of the things that we've been assessing uh, in New York State um, is trying to look at, there's been a lot of, of um, multiple policies that all are relatively small in impact, but all kind of co-occurring during the same time frame, right? And so the work we've been talking about doing, um, and what I, well, you'll hear me call this during period, um, we have a lot of work that we've been doing starting in 2006, carrying through to 2019, right? And in our first study, we were looking at all these different air quality actions that were occurring from, excuse me, 2018, excuse me, 2008, to 2013. And this is our kind of, this is the during pop, the during period, we called it. This is when all the air quality policies were occurring. And so what we wanted to do was look at the health rates uh, in the community for some health events before these policies went into place, during the time period when these policies were implemented, and then afterwards. And again, the idea being that hopefully we see not only a reduction in the rate of disease, um, but hopefully an improvement um, in, in the pollution levels as well. 
right? So what we found really um, in our Rochester work is we really do have changes in concentrations of PM 2.5. Um, this is uh, just a, a plot um, where you're seeing, uh, I think this is monthly averages of PM 2.5. Again, remember, these are the fine particles that can get down into your alveoli. And you're seeing this reduction, this long-term time trend going down. Right? So we've seen these re this reduction in Rochester. We've seen it all across New York State. It's not just us. Um, and also other pollutants, both gaseous and particle levels have all been coming down. Okay? Um, we've also done a bit of work. I have colleagues here uh, that do a bit of work more on the exposure side, not looking just at um, uh, all particles together, but looking and doing some of these source apportionment work, um, it's not factor analysis, but something similar to that, um, looking at uh, particles coming from different sources. And as you can see, there's uh, diesel particles coming from diesel engines, um, and then spark ignition vehicles or gasoline vehicles. All right? And what you can see, though, is for the trends of all these different types of particles, um, they're all generally going down except for these spark ignition vehicles. So that actually the amount of particles that's coming from automobiles has actually been increasing, right? And so overall, as you see, we have this big drop in pollution coming down. So not only do you have that improvement, but now what you're breathing in is more often coming from these, these spark ignition, these automobile car, automobiles. And some of that stuff's pretty nasty. Lots of organics um, in there that can, um, uh, that people are studying, but, but have been documented having all kinds of adverse health effects of various disease systems, right? So we're worried again about the particles becoming toxic. Um, and we, assume, we had originally assumed that pollution levels, these particles would become less toxic over time with all of these great air pollution policies. And what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about is that's probably not actually been the case, right? So looking, um, this is back to that, the work that we were doing of these case crossover designs. Um, and again, what's really useful about the case crossover design is it really allows these, these period specific comparisons uh, without a lot of complicated modeling procedures, right? So what we have here, each triangle that you see is the rate of a STEMI event associated with these, um, a standard unit increase in ultrafine particles, right? So for every 3,700 particles, ultrafine particles per cubic centimeter of air, when that goes up, there is an, um, an increased rate of a STEMI over the next hour, right? And that relative rate for that same dose of pollution, that same size pollution, if we look at before the policies were put in place, you have about a 10% increased rate of STEMI. If you look during the games, it's about an 8% uh, rate of STEMI. Um, and what we would have expected was in that after, after the policies were put in place, that you know, we should have a, a cleaner air that should have come down, should have come down, but in actually what it does, it went up in reverse, right? And what I'm showing you is STEMI and, and ultrafine particles. I have a couple more pollutants here to the right. Um, again, don't have time to talk about all of these works. We see very similar patterns for um, respiratory outcomes, asthma exacerbations, respiratory infection, um, specifically influenza, bacterial pneumonia. We see very similar patterns, really suggesting um, that perhaps the, the particles has, have themselves, yes, they came down in level, but perhaps they become more toxic. The chemical composition of them may be more toxic now. Right? And so that was, that, that was the study we had done uh, in New York State. Right? And the work that we're doing now um, is, is trying to build upon that. Right? So as I said in that previous study, the gasoline vehicles really appeared to be um, emitting um, uh, some, of the, you know, some of these organic, secondary organics that were coming from these emissions, some pretty nasty stuff. Um, so there's been a new policy put in place. Um, it's what it, we'll just call, it's called the tier three vehicles. Uh, but it's these tier three vehicles that were um, being introduced into the vehicle fleet here in the United States um, were, were, meant, were designed to have less of these organics emitted from them. So hopefully having a less toxic pollutant coming from the motor vehicles, right? And so what we can do on our epi side is ask the question, all right, does the rate of STEMI that's associated with these increased pollutant concentrations that we've been showing in our work, does that change after the tier three vehicles are introduced, right? And so what we would expect is that heightened uh, rate, relative rate that we see looking at ultrafine particles in STEMI 
that actually should come down. The size of that relative rate should come down because hopefully the particles are less toxic. Okay. So this is going to this design is really again using that time stratified case crossover, the logistic regression. And again, these are ST elevation MIs, these STEMIs that are treated at our cardiac cath lab. All right. Now, what's really useful for the case crossover design here is that um, we like the, the STEMI events that we use. Our cardiac cath lab does is they, they as a patient comes into the ER and then the cath lab they're for treatment, um, part of their diagnosis is to understand when did symptom onset occur. Right? And that's kept as part of the regular, regular record in the cath lab. Right? And we can use that symptom onset time to say, okay, when did we think the event actually occurred and have it down to the hour. And that's very helpful on our air pollution side is then we can match that to the air pollution levels outside at that exact hour. Right? And so we can, we can do this. And the idea behind the study was really to look at the, you know, those relative rates in 2014 to 2016 and then compare them to 2017 to 2019. Right. And so this, this is work that's just come out. Um, the paper is, I gave you the reference there, the paper is available um, um, on, you know, online. But looking specifically, um, what we see again, if you look at that black triangle all the way to the left, um, this is before the tier three vehicles were introduced. We have about a 22% rate of stemming associated with the, uh, here it's a, a 3,100 particles per cubic centimeter of air. If we look at that same 3,100 particles per cubic centimeter of air and the rate of STEMI, we see that we have no association in 2017 to 2019, right? potentially potentially due to um, the improvement in the, the tier three vehicles. Right? And if you look at uh, uh, these other pollutants that are here, we see the same pattern. Right? So we're looking to see all of these pollutants that come out of motor vehicles primarily, um, some other coming from other places, but motor vehicles really appears to be driving this. Right? And so perhaps this tier three vehicles are, are the potentially one of the, one of the things. Right? So one of the things uh, to talk a little more about that case crossover design to bring it back to kind of an epi methods thing here is to think a little bit about the design and what it allows you to do. Okay? And so what, if you think of uh, STEMI events, um, we're one big regional hospital here um, in the county. All right, so what you're seeing here, pictures, this is pictures of Monroe County where Rochester, New York is. Um, if you look at the one all the way on the left, there's beautiful Lake Ontario, if anybody knows that, one of the Great Lakes that's right above us, very pretty. Um, the black outline is Monroe County. Right? And so for our 2014 to 2016 time period, um, the residences of those STEMI patients are in red. Right? And our monitoring station is that yellow star. And so what we were concerned about was are there, is there greater degrees of exposure misclassification, greater degrees of bias, underestimation that might be occurring um, if there are people are living in vastly different distributions of residents, right? Is, is there, there a lot of error relative to how close they live to the monitoring site, right? But what you can see really, if you look at the 2017 to 2019 period is the study subjects in both of them, they really don't look to be too different in where they're living, right? There's very little difference um, in the, um, the, the distance from the monitoring site to the residents. So if we're trying to think of all the, you know, the potential reasons for why we might see what we see, it does not appear to be due to any um, exposure misclassification, at least a difference in that exposure misclassification and bias um, between the two time periods. Right? But what we've also um, been thinking a bit about is you know, anytime you're doing these period comparisons and you're looking at different study subjects, the question always comes, is, is the health event in the one period truly the same as the health event in the next period? I'm calling them STEMI, but are they truly the same thing? And, you know, talking to our clinical colleagues, um, STEMI is a STEMI. The way it's diagnosed hasn't changed. Um, the clinical features of it haven't changed, um, dramatically at least. And so the, the, the thought is that it's not um, it's not going to be a difference in, in STEMI necess necessarily. Um, but one of the things, again, you always have to think about is, um, is there some difference in the study subjects characteristics? Right? And so, as I said before, that case crossover design, um, by design, controls for all these factors that don't vary over time. Right? So your health history, your comorbidities, things like this. Um, it also, by design, controls for that time period issue I just showed you, because within each match set of the analysis, 
they're all the same, right? So really what we're, we're able to see is that, you know, I was very worried, you know, when I, we were starting to do this and I'm saying, well, is that relative rate that we see in 2014, 2016 different from that in 2017, 2019? Is it different just by virtue of they have different comorbidities, they have different health status over time and how can we control for that? And then, you know, sitting there banging my head against the wall, uh, not really, literally, but doing that with a few friends and an epidemiologist, it was uh, one of those funny, uh, I'm at a conference having a, a pint at the bar and we sat here and, and um, worked out a lot of these issues. Is it really, it controls, it's controlled for by design. So the case crossover really allows you to, without having to do, you know, three and four way interaction models, um, allows you by design to control for this, to know that that difference that we see by period is not gonna be due to anything about the patients. It's independent of that, right? The last thing I'll, I'll just describe was we, we said, well, let's make sure. Um, and we did some more analyses where we added an interaction term between the ultrafine particle concentration. And we, in our main model, we had ultrafine particles times period. And that was our interaction term in the model. And the top red, bo red box that you see is the effect estimates um, from our main analysis. So again, in 2014 and 2016, the odds ratio was a value of 1.22 in the main analysis. And in 2017, 2019, it's a value of 0 0.94, right? And then we did a series of sensitivity analyses where one at a time, we added all these different interaction terms of ultrafine particles times some, some subject characteristic or clinical characteristic. So for example, in the other box there, we put an interaction term between having a prior MI and ultrafine particles, right? And then re-estimated that main effect. And so you see the effect there is, is an odds ratio of 1.27, right? Which isn't all that different from an odds ratio of 1.22. And you could go down this table and really say, it didn't really matter how we, um, or what terms we put in our model, what other interaction terms we put in our model, um, it, it was, um, uh, it did quite well. So is the case crossover, you know, in a sense, that design feature really made for some less, um, uh, you know, less uh, complicated, certainly analyses, trying to understand um, whether or not these effects that we're, we're studying were, were uh, do we believe them or not, All right? And so last slide um, just really is to, to kind of lay out the, the case crossover design uh, versus other approaches. Um, I have another study that I'm working with some collaborators on down um, uh, another US uh, uh, university down in Georgia. And um, um, I couldn't convince them of the utility of the case crossover design. So in that one, we're doing some more standard time series modeling approaches, right? And um, we're doing very similar policy assessments. Um, but the issue there, if you're looking at say like hospital admissions, right? You need to make sure in order to do those types of models is you need to have the complete count of all the health events occurring in the community um, over time. And that's a lot of energy needs to be done to collect those. Um, however, for, for um, you could do that for a time series analyses, any of these, whatever our generalized additive models that we might use for this, rely on that. Um, and if you don't have that, then you could clearly have a biased effect estimate, right? But what's nice about the case crossover design is that you don't need complete outcome ascertainment in order to get an unbiased estimate, right? The analytic, mo the analytic model is looking at that match set, um, like a matched case control study. Um, so it really allows you um, not to have complete outcome ascertainment to still get a, a valid estimate of the relative of the relative rate of disease associated with the exposure. Right? Um, the limitation certainly though um, is we can't really uh, assess any chronic exposures. So I've laid out, you know, my research interests are really in these acute health effects um, and the, the case crossover design works very well for those, but it is not, um, this isn't something we use for cancer outcomes, chronic exposures, whatever it might be. The design doesn't uh, doesn't uh, work that way, All right? And then last is really we cannot really directly assess uh, or ask, directly estimate the rate of disease itself and seeing if that just changes from before or after a policy. It's a, that is a limitation of this design. So um, it does have its limitations, but um, um, I I've been wanting to use this, uh, have been using this for different research questions and found it a bit. Uh, really quite useful for it, right? So uh, thanks for uh, the attention. I'll, uh, I'll stop there and just thank the, certainly the funding agencies that paid for all of this and, uh, you know, our, our collaborators here at the University of Rochester that uh, really did a lot of the, the, the work I've, I've discussed. So 
Thanks very much. <laughs>